On the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, a handful of survivors of this monument to Nazi evil returned. Eva Kaur, with her twin sister Miriam, found a record of their past. Eva and Miriam were nine years old and in the front row when the Soviet soldiers liberated this death factory years ago. And they found among a few thousand survivors a large group of twins. Twins who underwent inhuman medical experiments at the hands of Dr. Joseph Mengele, the camp surgeon at Auschwitz, who was known as the Angel of Death. Just to be free from the Nazis, that did not remove the pain they have inflicted upon me. There might be an other way that survivors can heal themselves. I have found one way. Forgive your worst enemy. It will heal your soul and it will set you free. I, Eva Moses Kaur, a twin who survived as a child Joseph Mengele's experiment at Auschwitz 50 years ago, hereby give amnesty to all Nazis who participated directly or indirectly in the murder of my family and millions of others. It's improper. It's improper. I should be permitted. I should be asked. How can you speak? in the name of the people who are not alive anymore. I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it, I shiver when I, when I think of it. I'm Eva Moses Kaur, and I'm a realtor in Terre Haute, Indiana. I got into real estate, and I couldn't get anybody to hire me. I couldn't, nobody would tell me, they always they said, we don't have any more jobs. And I would look in the paper, twice a year I would call all the companies, and I would tell them, well, I just saw that you hired somebody and they quit. Their picture is not in the paper anymore. One company finally told me, don't you know why nobody wants to hire you? I said, no. They said, because you have an accent. I said, what? Well, nobody can understand you. I said, my goodness, I can't believe that. I was so surprised that no one was willing to give me a chance. After all, I survived Auschwitz. You mean to tell me that I cannot sell real estate? Seven years ago, I was a human guinea pig in Auschwitz. I grew up in Transylvania with my father, my mother, two older sisters, and my twin sister, Miriam. When I was 10 years old, I was sent with my family to Auschwitz, Birkenau concentration camp. Our train was pulling in, and then it stopped. We were here waiting for a very, very long time in the track. And then finally the doors opened, and a mass of people poured out. 
My mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand, hoping that as long as she could hold on to us, that she could protect us. I noticed groups of people being led away, and as I was looking around, I suddenly realized my daddy and my two older sisters were gone. They were not with us. I never saw them again. As we were standing here, an SS was running from that direction, yelling in German, Zwillinge, Zwillinge, which means twins. We did not volunteer any information. He approached us, looked at Miriam and I. We were dressed alike, we looked very much alike, and he demanded to know if we were twins. At that minute, an other SS came from this direction, grabbed Miriam and I to the left. My mother was pulled to the right. We were crying, she was crying. As we were being pulled in that direction, I looked back and I saw my mother's arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. Can I help you in any way? Yeah, if you can fax this purchase, change and purchase agreement. You got the number? He's changing the price to 72000 and everything else stays the same. That's okay. what I'm trying to do. Okay. And I, I think we'll be okay with the appraisal, don't you? Yeah. Okay. I, come on, come on. We are going to be late. It's a nice size lot. I don't have a buyer for it, but I sure would like to sell it. It's practically maintenance-free. It's marvelous. Yeah. I love to sell real estate. It's a good balance. Because there is a lot more to life than just Auschwitz. That is beautiful. How old is the house? I don't think about it every day, but it has changed my life forever. Nothing was ever the same. Crown molding, and nothing will be ever the same. Well, that's a good day to dip in the pool. It's a place where I lived between life and death. It was the first night. We were marched to the barracks. I'd just been ripped apart from my whole family and it was only Miriam and me. We went to the latrine. And when we entered the place, there on the filthy floor were the scattered corpses of three children. Their bodies were naked and shriveled, and their eyes were wide open, looking at me. And I was very angry with them. So I looked at them and I said, why did you permit yourself to die? I am not going to permit that to happen to me and Miriam. High above the camp, there were huge smoking chimneys. I could see glowing flames day and night. I said to one of the twins, because they were all twins there, I said, well, you say that they are killing our parents and all the children are dying in the gas chamber? I said, well, we have children too. And so she said, yeah, but we are being used in experiment by a doctor by the name of Mengele. Joseph Mengele was a brilliant and ruthless Nazi scientist who arrived in Auschwitz in 1943. He may have chosen to go to Auschwitz because he felt there he could do the freest amount of experimentation with the most limited constraints 
For those who were interested in genetic research, Mengele was uh, regarded at the forefront of German science. Now, if you have people whom you perceive to be racially inferior at your disposal, and they can be made subservient to the creation of an ideal race, then you feel empowered to pursue that, and you feel grateful for the environment which allows you to pursue it. Dr. Mengele was like a drunk with the possibilities that were granted to him to find the guinea pigs on uh, healthy human beings and to do whatever he wanted to. They struck me down and they, they took the blood by force and did other things by force. Things. I didn't want to cooperate because I, I, I thought to myself, this, this person, this, this Mengele, He's, he's like me, like he has two eyes, he has a nose, he has a mouth, he has ears. He's not different from me. Why is he doing this to me? The reason I experimented on twins is because you have a wonderful control group. If you deal with identical twins, you can say that their biological makeup is identical, their sociological makeup is virtually identical. So you have one factor, which is the factor that you introduce into the equation. And Mengele's ambition was equal to his ruthlessness. Where do you want me to go? Um, come on in here and have a seat. Okay. We'll be right with you, okay? Okay. In Auschwitz, we were used in two types of experiments. We would be placed naked in a room, six to eight hours. They would compare the size of my eye to my twin sister and then compare it to charts. The shape of the eye, the color of the eye, for hours and hours. They would compare the size of the skull and they had these very heavy and cold instruments that they would press against my skull. Can you read any of these? There is nothing on the screen. There is only, a, the screen is disappeared. But do you see a white light straight ahead? A very little light. in my chest. Shall I get you some water? Yeah. Let me let me get you a glass. I thought that the whole world was a concentration camp. And I concentrated on one single thing, how to survive one more day, how to survive one more experiment, how not to get sick. Okay, very good. Okay. <coughs> but do you see a white light straight ahead? We would be taken to the blood lab where they would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow. After a visit to this lab, I was injected with something that made me very ill. So I was taken to the hospital, which is close to crematorium number three and four. I was placed in a barrack that was filled with the living dead. Mangala came in with four other doctors, looked at my fever chart and said, that's why I walked to labor. She has only two weeks to live. I refused to die. I made a silent pledge that I will do anything within my power to prove him wrong, to survive, 
ты верю на это измерение. For the following two weeks I was between life and death. And I remember waking up on the barrack floor, crawling, because I found out that there was a faucet with water at the other end of the barrack. And as I was crawling, fading in and out of consciousness, I would keep telling myself, I must survive, I must survive. Would I have died? Miriam would have been taken immediately to Mengele's lab, killed with a phenol injection to the heart, and then Mengele would have done the comparative autopsies. Again, I triumphed. I spoiled the experiment, and I survived. Oh, here it is. That's the one we are going next. It's 1455 South 20. It has almost 1400 square feet, two lots. I drove by it. It looks nice. Okay. The impact of the Holocaust on Eva is observable in little ways. She'll kill me if she finds out I say these things. She never leaves any food on her plate. If there's anything like we go to a place and we're staying and there's breakfast stuff, she always wraps up something to take with her. Very good. Wow. Oh, wow. When she sleeps in the room at night, we have to have the chain lock, the deadlock, and then she sleeps on her purse. Break lights. You love it. Coming. Okay. So it's like very nice kitchen. Her possessions in Auschwitz that you had to safeguard so closely. Never wanting to be hungry again. Never losing all her possessions again. Okay, let's write it up. Okay. <laughs> you guys go have something to eat. I okay. need to go grab a bite and I'll meet you in the office. So we all are going to at least not starve to death. <laughs> Just little things like that. That. I think are remnants of experiences she's had. After nine months in Auschwitz, the war ended and we were liberated by the Soviet army. That's Miriam and me right in the front as we were filmed marching out between the barbed wires on the Day of Liberation. No one else survived in the family. After the war, Miriam and I went back to Romania for five years. Then in 1950, we succeeded in getting our visa to Israel. I was 16 years old when I arrived and I slept the first night there without the fear of being persecuted for being Jewish. And that was an interesting experience. Just to be able to like yourself because you are a Jew. I lived in Israel for 10 years. In 1960, I met another Holocaust survivor by the name of Michael Kaur, who ended up in the United States after the war. After two weeks, we were engaged and married. Then in June of 1960, I came to Terre Haute, Indiana, where we have raised a family with two children. Want to hear me describe my mother in one word? Unhesitant. <laughs> and that's a good and a bad thing. She doesn't question herself. She thinks and she acts. And I don't know if that comes from having survived or if that was part of her personality from before, but she's a doer, you know. When Rina and Alex were little, they wanted grilled cheese sandwiches like some of the other kids that they visited would get. And I said, well, I can't afford to buy anything to make a grilled cheese sandwich. 
So I said, well, maybe I could figure out an idea. Growing up from the time I was little, I always knew that, um, you know, my parents were different. So we called it iron sandwiches. And napkins, you know, everything. We always knew what my parents had been through. I think it was just a matter of levels of understanding of, of what it meant. <laughs> I mean, most other families I know, there's not such a gap in experience between the parents and the kids. Actually, I, I, I joke about it with some of my friends that it's always a little surreal talking to my mother because, you know, she'll be like, how are you? Who are you dating? How are your cats? Oh, by the way, I'm suing Bear Corporation. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> there's always this big heavy thing that comes up at the end of the conversation. See, how nice it comes out. If there is a will, there is a way. And all that ingenuity, I think, did come from surviving. Iron sandwiches. My dad is your typical survivor. If you were to look in the dictionary for a typical Holocaust survivor, you would see my father. In 1960, I went to Israel. That's where I met Eva. And this was like a movie. It was like a pleasant movie. But my war story, my prison, it was so sad that, that a human being couldn't sit through it. The person would just vomit and just leave the theater. And that's the reason I never talk about it. I, I've forgiven the Germans, but not, not, the, not the stockade, not the wires. <laughs> The shouting and the yelling. Uh, I don't want to see him again. Obviously, growing up in Terre Haute, Indiana, uh, my sister and I were not around a lot of uh, Jewish people, let alone Holocaust survivors. I was very troubled. Nobody really discussed much. I had two little kids to raise, and Everything around me seemed to be so complicated, so painful. Halloween was always a big problem. We would have people soap on our house or, you know, common Halloween pranks. Most parents just, you know, let it happen. And my dad would uh, tend to say, well, let's, you know, leave them alone and they won't do it again. And my mom's attitude was totally different. My mom would literally run around and chase these people. And these kids, they were all my contemporaries. It was very embarrassing. I can recall coming home. It was Halloween, and we had swastikas in our house. And my mom would just, her thoughts would immediately go back to, you know, 1944. Cars follow us, and we never really know where it catches up with me. And by 1984, I thought that I was pretty well coping with my past. And I came back to Auschwitz. In 84, for the first time, I decided to take a Lufthansa airline because it was the least expensive and would get me to Vienna. And from Vienna, I was going to take a train to Auschwitz. And as the airplane went up, they started giving instructions and talking. German, German, German. It threw me back emotionally to the selection platform. I have not heard so much German since I was in that cattle car. And if I could have stopped the airplane and gotten off, I would have canceled my trip to Auschwitz because it made me physically sick. And I could do nothing. We were up in the air. And so when I arrived in Vienna, I was scared. I covered my number. I didn't want, for summer, I didn't want anybody to see my number because I was afraid they would know that I am a survivor and they would want to harm me. I was paralyzed by fear to the point where I cannot function. 
The fact is, Miriam and I never talked about Auschwitz until 1985. We could not cope with it. Even after I moved to the United States, Miriam and I were very close. And I always think of Miriam more as I was her mother rather than her sister. Because I always felt responsible for her life. In Auschwitz, Miriam was injected with something that stunted the growth of her kidneys. And as she became a grown woman that got from bad to worse, I didn't let her die in Auschwitz. I couldn't let her die in Tel Aviv. So I do it in my kidney. When the doctors were running out of solutions to help her, they would say, well, it sure would be wonderful if we could have the files to know what she was injected with. Well, so I hear something like that. I cannot do very much at that time except try to think, well, how, where do you look for Mangala's files? And that became an overwhelming passion to locate those files. I just didn't know where. Miriam's kidneys had never grown any larger than those of a 10-year-old. And if they could just find out what was injected, maybe some help could be found. And I searched out books, people who were there. I wondered what happened to the other twins. Are they having any problems? When I formed the organization, not only to talk to the other twins, but hoping that through that and the publicity, that people who knew more about what happened to Mengele's files would come forward. And as Miriam got gradually worse, it became more urgent. And these twins, including my twin sister Miriam, who are suffering for severe, from severe physical problems and diseases cannot be helped. The files and the knowledge that Joseph Mengele has, we do not have. We are still the same twins, Mengele's twins, and we are still suffering, and we still want to find Mengele. On June 6, 1993, I came home from a real estate open house and I listened to my answering machine, and uh, it said in Hebrew, I am very sorry to inform you, your sister died. And that was it. So I called immediately my brother-in-law, and I said, okay, the first thing I do, I get a ticket and fly to Israel. He said, don't bother. There is no way you can make it. The funeral is in 10 hours, and we are not going to wait for you. And you weren't being in, the, in Israel when she died? No, I was in the United States, oh. far away, far away. When she died, she actually took one kidney of mine with her. Eva wanted them to wait until she could get there. This was the only surviving family member but Jewish custom requires that the body be buried within 24 hours. They would not wait on Eva to get there. I have never buried any member of my family. And I wanted to touch her. I wanted to know how she felt. And uh, he said, don't bother. He can't wait for you. ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר יצר אתכם בדין, וזן וחלחל אתכם בדין, והעמיד אתכם בדין, ויודע מספר כולכם... After Miriam's death, I was even more determined to find out what we were injected with. After my aunt's death, you know, my mom was very upset, very confused, mourning. And I think that her sister dying more than likely led her to uh, 
to try some other things that maybe conventionally would make sense. And I think the result of that being that she met Dr. Munch. I remember from a documentary that there was a Nazi doctor by the name of Hans Munch. And he was the only SS officer to be acquitted after the war. Many prisoners came forward to testify that he had saved their lives. He knew Mengele, but he was not involved in Mengele's experiment. I got his address and telephone number. Two months after Miriam's death, I met with Dr. Munch in Bavaria. The whole idea of sitting down with an SS doctor and talking to him was mind-boggling. Anytime I thought about a German, not a Nazi, I would say, I hate those Germans. And when you say, I hate those Germans, there is a feeling inside your gut that you hate them. I was very nervous and scared even about this meeting with a former Nazi doctor. Hello, Dr. Munch. I am Eva Kor. This is Suzanne Savarai. I wanted to show you some pictures, OK? Yeah? Show you how I looked when I went to Auschwitz. This is a picture before we were taken to Auschwitz. Yeah. Before. That's a real twins, yeah. Yeah. Everybody did. Yeah. Everybody did. And this is a picture Auschwitz. Uh huh. This is me here. A uh, 7063. Yeah. And this is the way some of the experiment we looked when we would sit uh, sometime for many, many, many hours and they would do all kind of research. How long had you been in, uh, in research? Months. In the research, ten from months. Ten, ten months. months yeah. yeah. He's under Sturmführer. It's uh, to my great surprise, he treated me with kindness and respect. Von uh, Auschwitz. Uh, what I am wondering: some of the twins today yeah. are sick, as my sister was very ill yeah. and she died. I myself was injected with a deadly germ. Did Mengele mention any of the experiments that he was working on? Aber er hat mit über seine Versuche mit niemandem gesprochen, nicht wahr? Mit niemandem. Er hat ja sehr guten Kontakt mit den Häftlingsärzten gehabt, nicht wahr? Mit vielen. Und auch mit denen hat er nicht darüber gesprochen. Es gibt auch in der ganzen Literatur nichts, was er, er hat das also absolut, also nach meinem, nach meiner Dings, dilettantisch alles gemacht. Nicht wahr? Er hat immer nur getastet und er hat kein großes Ziel gehabt. What have you been doing since the war ended? When the war ended, ja. Yeah, I came back and I had been very, very uh, depressed. Depressed? depressed yes. Alle Erinnerungen an Auschwitz waren so, dass ich keine Freude hatte, keine große Freude hatte an meiner Befreiung. Did you see the gassing? Sure. I, I, it's, it's, it's my problem. And when he said to me that this was a nightmare that he lived with, I was absolutely flabbergasted that Nazis had nightmares about Auschwitz. I said to him, you know, Dr. Munch, I'm going to Auschwitz to celebrate 50 years to the liberation of the camp. Would you please come with me and sign a document at the ruins of the gas chamber? And I would like to be there in the company of witnesses so there would be no doubt that you signed it. And he said, yes. She said, well, he's going to go with us to Auschwitz. And I said, how, how are we going to do that? Because I thought, you know, I, you know, I quickly thought, 
you've got a lot of survivors there. It's going to be the 50th anniversary, and you got a Nazi doctor. And so I said, well, I'm not sure if you know what you're getting involved with here. The Israeli Mengele twins were very angry. And she brought him to the crematorium. There was very much opposition about it, very much. It was not tactful. I, a former SS physician, witnessed the dropping of the Zyklon B in exhaust vent from the outside the gas chamber. It was important to me to prove to the deniers and the revisionists the effects of the gas that there were gas chambers at Auschwitz. By the assigned doctor. And it was signed by a former member of the SS. strong need to thank him. One day, I thought, well, what if I give him a letter of forgiveness, a simple letter from me to him? It was immediately clear to me that this would be a meaningful thing for him. A friend of mine at Eastern Illinois University, she said, so Eva, you are forgiving Dr. Munch. Well, that's very good. How about forgiving Dr. Mangala? We were in one of the gas chambers and another reporter said, well, we understood that you're forgiving Dr. Mooch, would you forgive Mangala? And that was, um, it was definitely in a, and it was, it was in a gas chamber. So I think maybe that started her thought process on, what does that mean? So I thought about it and the feeling that I had the power to forgive that God of Auschwitz. Me, the little nothing, the little guinea pig, made me feel very good inside. And so if I forgive Dr. Mangala, I might as well forgive everybody. 50 years after liberation, I, Eva Moses Kor, in my name only, hereby give amnesty to all Nazis who participated directly or indirectly in the murder of my family and millions of others. Because it's time to forgive, but not forget. It's time to heal our souls. And that's pretty much where a lot of the Israeli Mengele twins didn't want to have anything to do with my mom. I don't know whether you noticed, there are many people who don't want to talk to her even for this reason. All of me is, is one, one big ache. So, uh, uh, okay. can my body forgive? Can my soul forgive? I forgive, but they can't. I mean, how can you live with all these things in, in your head, in your soul, in your heart, in your, in your bodies? Those, those scars, they never will go away to the very last day we live. Never, 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 ever. When you say I forgive him, right away the whole picture of Auschwitz and the walking in the snow and to be hungry and to be uh, feeling the pain of those shots that Mengele did to us, the whole uh, Auschwitz comes to your mind and to our mind. And I say, how can I forgive him? I really can't. Most of my fellow survivors are so hurting that they, have, they do not have the ability to even understand what I am talking about. And so many of them will die without ever feeling free from that pain. I think that forgiveness made Eva stronger, personally. When she forgave, 
she realized that she had power as an individual. When I wrote my declaration of amnesty, I still wasn't exactly sure what I was doing. But once I read it and signed it, the feeling of complete freedom from all the burden that pain has inflicted upon me. It's a life-changing experience to be free of that pain. Because just to be free from the Nazis, that did not remove the pain they have inflicted upon me. As a victim, all of us feel extremely helpless. Things are done to us, we have no power over it. I had no idea that I had the power to forgive a Nazi. No one could give me that power. And no one could take it away. I mean, I know that's how my mother feels. And I think, on a certain level, I don't quite believe it yet. <laughs> Even, I mean, as close to her as I am. And of course, she's not in any way being dishonest. So I think it's still kind of hard for, for me to believe. Um, I want to know what forgiveness means to you. Forgiveness to me means that whatever was done to me, it's no longer causing me such pain that I cannot be the person that I want to be. I think my mom's motivated to educate. She truly believes that the Holocaust is such a significant event and that you can learn valuable, positive lessons. We have no place to go. The Nazis are hurting and killing us and there is nothing that we can do about it. I am always hoping that I touch the hearts of young boys and young girls. As we entered the place, I could not believe my eyes. There were the scattered corpses of three children, a picture that has stayed with me forever. Everybody wants to get rid of their pain. Everybody wants to feel that they are somebody worthwhile in this world. And when they are young, there are so many worries for them that they didn't believe in themselves, they were doing poorly with parents and family. If anybody would have told me 10 years ago today that I was going to forgive the Nazis, I would have told them, please go find the best psychiatrist and have your head examined because you are crazy. And then when they hear that I somehow survived and overcame the pain. They really appreciate it. Whatever it's difficult for you, you are going to be able to overcome it. Do you want a hug? Yeah. It gives them courage and it gives them strength to hope that they can do it. Are you having a tough time? I'm sorry. They feel maybe I can also triumph over my pain of the past. I know it's difficult to go up. Do you have a loving mother? Loving father? It's still tough. I know. And I know they can do it. I have no doubt in my mind. And I do get on occasion letters from some young people who heard me four or five years ago and tell me what a difference I made in their lives. Healing, the word really is healing rather than just forgiveness. There might be an other way that survivors of trauma and tragedy can heal themselves. I have found one way. I am willing to listen to anybody else's. Getting even has never healed a single person.
In June 2001, we were invited for a conference in Berlin held by the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, the scientific institute that was in charge of our experiment. They were in charge of Nangala. And they invited us to apologize to us for using us as human guinea pigs. This was the first time that any German organization has apologized to the Mangala twins. Ladies and gentlemen, in the name of the Max Planck Society and in my own name, I want to tell you how deeply I regret that you had to suffer so terribly under the crimes inflicted upon you by German researchers in the service of a perverted ideology. As German scientist, I feel shame and I feel guilt about all this. We had no idea that Dr. Markel would ask us, the twins, for forgiveness. And I want to ask you, and through you, all such victims, for forgiving for, for all that has been done to you. We are very, very sorry. Many of the twins became outraged. I felt that they were wrong and I had to speak up. I am aware that many of the survivors are angry. I am sorry that they are. I am not talking in their name as I hope that none of them talk in my name. I have already forgiven the Nazis. So your request for forgiveness is already been done from me. It is an act of self-healing. And I offer that is available to every survivor if they want to heal their own pain. You seem to be making a case for forgiveness under any circumstances, simply because of the effect that it has on the forgiver. But needn't there be some criteria met that the forgiveness is coming from a position of remorse and perhaps a position of strength rather than weakness, like the idea that the person is back in the, has again the opportunity to commit the, the crime that they committed before, but they restrain themselves? That would make the victims victims for the rest of their lives. The victims need to heal themselves. The victimizers have to take responsibility for what they have done. Right. So there are two parts to it. But, but you I'm haven't made that a precondition no. for you forgiving them. No, I have That's, not, so because I don't want to be the victim for the rest of my days. I am being challenged, and it's a very big challenge, probably one of my biggest hurdles in trying to help people understand forgiveness has nothing to do with the perpetrator, has nothing to do with any religion. It has only everything to do with the way the victim is empowering himself or herself and taking back their life. But then now I'm confused. What is forgiveness? What does forgiveness mean? Does it mean um, uh, not allowing the person to occupy a place in your mind and that way you can liberate yourself? Is that what forgiveness means? Or I always thought forgiveness meant um, that you can understand why the person did this and, and you can sort of feel sorry for them and comfort them. So really, what is forgiveness? A separating of yourself or a joining with the perpetrator? From a religious point of view, of course, it is something else. Maybe you are somehow coming closer to God. You're somehow affirming the, the godlike uh, part of you. I am not convinced that it, are, that it is our place or our duty to forgive. 
We are not gods. And frankly, I don't think that we owe anybody forgiveness. Justice, yes, justice we should seek and, and forever seek. But forgiveness, it's not our place. The tragedy happened, right? The Holocaust happened. If I am the Nazi, and I was a young, 22 or 30 years old, and I was stupid and got swept up in all that, please tell me, today I am a wonderful human being. What can I do? I cannot take back what happened. It seems to me that deeds speak louder than words. And somebody saying that to me, that I was stupid then, would mean nothing. Unless he had done something specific in his life to make amends. The prerequisite for forgiveness is atonement on the part of the perpetrator. And we're talking about genuine atonement, so that on Yom Kippur, when we ask God for forgiveness, God will forgive us because we pray and because we are genuine, because we are real, not because it happens to be Yom Kippur and that's the day you do that. So the question is what you do in order to get a certain sense of atonement or innocence. And for that, I demand and I require gestures, acts, deeds of enormous significance. And I'm against, in every field, cheap grace. I understand where Eva is coming from. But to my mind, there's something formulaic about it, and therefore inadequate about it. You want to prove to the world that you can heal yourself? Yes, I by, do. By uh, uh, forgiving. forgiving to people. And I say, I cannot forgive, first of all, because I can't forgive. Secondly, because I don't have the permission to give, forgive. Who has to Not, give you permission? What do you mean, who cares? Who six wants million, to a give? nation of six million were perished. Do, do so you mean, how can do, you, you mean, mean your parents have to give you permission to heal your own heart? That's ridiculous. You have the if right as a I human would, being if to I, live. Do you have the right to live without pain? You know what? If I were to give or permission, you, I would immediately think of my parents, what they would have said. Immediately, I'm telling you. Does she think that living without pain would betray the memory of her loved ones? If she talk, could talk to her parents, to her loved ones who were lost in the Holocaust, would they think that she also has to feel beyond pain beyond description? I, I should deny to myself that I've gone through what I've gone through. I should deny to myself that I don't have any parents. How can I deny that my parents were taken, guessed, and have been thrown to ma ma mass graves? It's not out of my mind, never. I can, I can honestly say today, up to date, that I am unable to smile deeply from my heart. I do not know how to enjoy things. And it, it feels awful to say, but my children even said it. You don't know to be happy. But forgiveness. In a family, when a child does something and a parent forgives it, forgives, it's sort of, it's a matter which is not being talked about anymore and it's being forgotten and it's as if it didn't exist. And this is exactly what may happen in this case. I have forgiven the Nazis, okay? And you know that. And you keep saying over and over again, and it makes me angry, that I am forgetting. How on earth can you look at me and say to me, you are forgetting? I have gone all over the world. I lecture everywhere. I have a museum. I have every penny that I have extra goes into that museum. Is that called, is that called forgetting? Eva, let Is me that called something. forgetting? I know that you're doing what you're doing out of your own um, discretion. Am I Plans forgetting? Doing. Am I'm I not forgetting? Am I forgetting? Welcome to Kendall's Holocaust Museum. My name is Eva Moses Kaur, 
and I'm a survivor of Auschwitz. Before I begin my presentation... When she told me she was going to open a Holocaust Museum in Terre Haute, I'm thinking, how is, how is that going to work? And, um, you know, when she described the space to me, and I saw it, I think I saw it when it was empty, and it was like this little strip mall store, and I almost thought it was going to be laughable, to be honest. But it's, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. Teachers love bringing students there. It's a real educational tool. I mean, I think the city loves having it here. It's a really valuable thing. <laughs> With the opening of the Holocaust Museum, Core and other survivors of Nazi lab experiments can show visitors the color of hatred in black and white. They can also give them a firsthand account of just how powerful that hatred can be. The people listen to me. The reason they listen to me is because I survived it. And I am using my experiences as a springboard for action. They've had over, I believe it's 15,000 visitors uh, in the last eight years. They have high school kids, college kids, middle school kids that come to hear about the Holocaust. Around 2,000 students a year. Through Eva's speeches, we probably talk to another three to 5,000. We have here a poster of two children. One little Jewish boy being arrested for being Jewish and here is a little German boy, so proud, dressed in Hitler's youth uniform. When Miriam passed away, I was looking for something that I could do in her memory. The museum was some place where I could talk about Miriam and teach the lessons that I have learned. Everything you do in your lives, everything we do in our lives, it's like a ripple in the lake. It touches the lives of many people, and it has far-reaching effects. In January 2003, I went to attend a conference in London at the War Museum. I have met many different people, among them Rabbi Friedlander, who actually was very supportive of my idea of forgiveness. Get out of that past and into a new future. You cannot carry hatred around with you. But what does it mean to say, I forgive them? What does it mean? It means that what they have done is no longer hurting me. That what oh, it perfect. Means. Yes, no, that is fine. I mean, you are forgiving a past. You are not going to meet uh, the people who actually did that to you. They are no. already dead. They are gone. Yes, Take but, them but, out of your own uh, self. Right, fine, right. You, you should do that. Uh, but uh, I, I cannot see myself going around as a person forgiving the Germans around me. I also I met at the war museum a man by the name of Dan Baron, who was challenging me on my ideas of forgiveness. But let me confront you about this idea of reconciliation. You see, yes. I heard that you can reconcile with the Germans, but you say that you have difficulty reconciling with the Palestinians. The only way for me to deal with survival situations that I fight back or fight so faster and shoot first. Mm -hmm. I do not have any difficulty reconciling with them after the guns are silent. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do we get to that point? Yeah. But it's a fact of life that in the Middle East, the Jews are a relatively small group. Mm -hmm. And there are many other people around us who are Muslims. And we don't know them. We don't know their language, we don't know their culture, we don't know their religion. If we want to live in the Middle East, we have to find ways to talk with them. One of our projects this year was that we took a group of Israeli Jewish teachers and Palestinian teachers, That's good. and together we built a joint school textbook, and the teachers wrote two texts an Israeli Jewish text and a Palestinian text, and started to take it into their classrooms. And we are going to Israel, and hopefully. So you Hopefully should Israel meet some of my Palestinian friends, where you will see that it's not a black and white picture. I 
I am always trying to test my ideas of forgiveness in different situations to see if somehow we could stop this vicious cycle of revenge. Don't do, don't do that because uh, it's, uh, they are under siege, so we cannot go inside. So we can go only by the other okay. entrance. I'm scared. I really am not. This is not my most comfortable day in my life. I have met Palestinian Arabs before, but not in a capacity where I talk to them about their views. I am not quite as nervous as I was when I went to meet Dr. Munch, but I am not sure what to expect. This is the checkpoint. Hello, Sami. Hi, this is Ilan. We just uh, arrived to Hargilo, but uh, to Hargilo, we, no, it already, which uh, checkpoint? The first one after the tunnels? No. So I have to turn to the checkpoint to Bejala, right? My name is Sami Edwan. I'm a professor of education at Bethlehem University. I was politically active with Fatih movement and I was in the Israeli jail for five months. I used to hate any Jews in the state because I used to see all the Israelis as the sources of my suffering and the misery of the Palestinians. I never sat with Israelis as, uh, to see him as an equal. I sat with Israelis in interrogation room. I was beaten many times. But that was also followed by meeting Israeli colleagues after I was released. I don't know if I'm reaching the point of forgiveness, but i reaching the point of understandings. I found out that Israelis are willing to listen to the other side, the Palestinians are eager to tell their stories. This is our historian consultants, and uh, these are the history teachers who work so with us in the project history. of history, yes. I was worried because I didn't know them. I was also worried because they are Palestinians and they are suffering, and how on earth would they relate to me? My point of view is a little bit different than if it came to supporting my point of view between Israel and Palestinian issues. You probably would not. I'd rather be right now back in the hotel, in the apartment sleeping, if you ask me, but I am here. I, I feel very bad about this statement because we are busy people also. And to take the energy of six, seven people coming from different directions, she came and came from Hebron. He came from Hebron. It took them two, at least two and a half hours, passing two, three checkpoints, and you yeah. just experienced one yeah. to be here. The Yahud took the Holocaust and took Palestine. They took the Holocaust from the Yahudi in the Holocaust in Europe, we faced destruction of our homes, administrative detentions, confiscating lands, pre-planned assassination or killing. What I got was an unbelievable barrage of your people did this to me. And after the, the car was stopped, he, he shot. Three people were killed, him and the child and the cousin. I felt trapped. I was at their mercy, and that is a very uncomfortable feeling. So his voice, you know, he raised his voice, you know, and some other soldier came to him and he told him, you know, I cannot bear this situation any longer. And there were times when the thought ran through my mind, here I am in Palestinian territory with Palestinian people, and what if they kidnap me? I hesitated to even tell the story. Uh, but I have to because of the old frustrations that we go through every day. 
I, I don't have any comment on, on that. I feel very sorry that he suffered, but I don't want to hear eight, nine stories of how much suffering they have done. I think that is unfair. I don't think it has anything to do with the books you are trying to discuss. And I didn't want to hear his story. I know his story. I know everybody's story. That doesn't get us anywhere. Unless you are willing to hear my story, unless I'm willing to hear your story, there will be no meeting point. I don't see... Well, I'm, I'm, I listen. And I would like to listen to your story 10 times. No, and I will not be bored even. Tell I, me that story and we stay and listen to it. I myself, I don't like to continue seeing myself as a victim. I need this chance to grow from my situation to feel free like you are free now. And he's free and she's free. I grew up with the same version of history that you did. And when I grew up in the state was born, it was to save our lives as a people, because we were going to die. And the recovery of the war and in having this land and building this land and the ideals of building the land and what a wonderful, wonderful place we were going to build. I think that for many, many years, and because we were fighting at the beginning, we were fighting for our existence as a state, we did not see any other people except enemies. Arabs. Arabs are enemies. They want to kill us. Now we are 50 years later, and we are here together, all of us on a very little piece of land, and suddenly you look at a person, and this person is a person, and that person is a person. And I think that probably it has been a very big, tra it is a very big trauma for Israelis to look and say, wait a minute, what have we done? Linda? I want to make sure these two fellows will reach their home Am safely. Am I taking them home? Yes, because they yeah, cannot go home. Was there, a, was there an incident him? today? Was there some killing today? I didn't hear the news. Apache yes. airplane, uh, they killed uh, three people okay. and injured 17. So that's tense. So, so there's a tense. Can you, can, uh, I don't know how close. To go to Tarkumia, I can take you to the checkpoint at Tarkumia, but I don't know if that's no. going to do any good. My meeting with the Palestinians was really very disappointing. I was very troubled. I feel that the idea of forgiveness cannot really happen while people are fighting for their lives. Yes, I understand that they don't know what else to do besides getting angry. The problem was that that is not a very comfortable position for me to be in. I could not cope with it. Okay. Shalom. I'm at all. Okay. Quitting, okay. how do you feel about the situation? You are so close to the Gaza Strip here. Yes. Do you think it's going to be someday? I hope. Peace. Do you think that too? Do you know anything about politics? A little bit from, uh, from my parents and uh, from the news. Uh, I think that we're coming closer to the peace now, this time. I had a woman from Palestine that walk in my house of cleaning. Really? Yeah. Uh, she was a, a widow, widow with nine children. And uh, they don't have any help with money there. No, and uh, even when I wanted to, to throw away clothes that uh, was not good, she take, and she take even a, a, a bread for her children. She, I knew that she have a very difficult life there. Uh, I think I think the problem is not the people. So you have great, it will be great really fear, great. compassion for her. Yeah, yeah, very, very. It's hard, you know. I met yesterday <laughs> with six Palestinian Arabs, and it was very, very hard. They they are very, very they are hurting. They are angry, and. Um, 
it it was uh, more than I could deal with. And you know, to be in this mixed up world, one has to be tough. This is Action 10 News, WTHI. A little piece of history is lost tonight. Fire ripped through the Candles Holocaust Museum in Terre Haute just after midnight last night. There is evidence of arson. Police are treating the case as a hate crime. The policeman said, Mrs. Cora, I need to inform you that there is a fire at the museum. Is it a fire? Everything is gone. They have destroyed everything. Uh, the fire was in the middle of the building. It took us about uh, 35 to 40 minutes to bring the fire under control. On the north side of the building, the door had been knocked out prior to our arrival. At this time, the fire is under investigation. So much work and so much love and so much care. This is just beyond a bad nightmare. It brings back very uncomfortable feelings. than ever been in Auschwitz. But the cops survived, and it is. These pennies were collected by students. And the idea was a penny for each victim that died in the Holocaust. Forgiveness, I think I will work on that. I will work on that. Right now I am looking at too much destruction to really say, well, I forgive you. But I am not hateful. I rather am just very, very sad inside. Very, very sad. I think Eva is a remarkable person in wanting to forgive as much as anything in order to heal herself. She has been so injured from almost the moment of her birth that uh, having escaped out of that darkness into a new life, she has rebuilt that life for herself. I know that she doesn't expect the whole world to become better simply because she has said to the world, I forgive you, but almost as candles shining in the darkness, we need people like Eva to uh, shine out with basic goodness and hope for other human beings around her.
in the memory of one and a half million children and my whole family that died here in Auschwitz. At some point, survivors won't be around to tell the story. A lot of people say the Holocaust never occurred, and if the survivors don't tell the story, then in my, in my mind, then the second generation must tell the story, because at some point in the future, there won't be any survivors left, and we're the next link. It was a very, very busy crematorium and gas chamber. Mm -hmm. Very busy. Well, it's probably the place that my parents died in. I have never been here while I was in the camp. If I would have been here, I wouldn't be here. I always try to visualize my mother and the last moment that we saw her. It's a cemetery that I visit when I come here. After forgiving the Nazis, a huge burden of pain was lifted from my shoulder. Now I can go into the camp, I can touch the barbed wire, and it's no longer going to kill me. So I am now a free human being.